Now, look at verse 12. I love this. 1 Peter 4, 12. Beloved, don't think it strange concerning the fiery trial which is to try you as though some strange thing appeared or some, some strange thing happened to you. What I wrote is, first century believers faced horrible sufferings. And so do current believers face horrible sufferings. Bonnie and I were meeting, uh, doing a ministry with church planners, and that's why we were on the subway in Beijing. The man who was our contact with the church planners, I mean, he'll, he will have a stroke at the rate he's going. He was so conscious... He was like, Bonnie and I started getting nervous. He was, he was always looking for cameras, and he would, you know, he was always aware of the surveillance that goes on there. And it's gotten to the point now in China that if you jaywalk, they have so many cameras that in your district where you live, your picture and name will come up on a board of offenders because you jaywalked across the street in a city of 20 million. They have everyone's face on their system. I mean, they're the ones that sell us all the surveillance gear. That's because they're perfecting it themselves. And so he lives in a surveillance society. And I think of, and he lost his wife who, who didn't want to be with him because he was a Christian. He lost his job in this commercial bank because he wouldn't become a Communist Party member. And so he couldn't have a good job. And he was suffering. And I think about what Peter said, Beloved, don't think it's strange concerning the fiery trial that's to try you. And so we need to realize that suffering's always been a part of God's plan. Suffering refines us. As Job said, you know, uh, when I'm tried and purified, I'll come forth as gold, as the, the song popularizes Job's words. That's what we need to realize. Suffering is not an enemy. It's a refinement. But not only did first century believers face horrible suffering. Look at verse 13. It says, but rejoice. To the extent that you partake of Christ's sufferings, that when his glory is revealed, you may be glad with exceeding joy. One of the privileges Bonnie and I had, we were flying, I told you about Tampa, and the guy talking behind me at the 7-Eleven. We were on our way to another conference, and I got a text from a friend. He says, hey, will you stop in our Bible study? And we stopped in the Bible study, and his beloved wife had a stroke, and she has declined and declined and declined. And it's a labor for her to even talk. It's a labor for her. I mean, it's painful to sit in her wheelchair. Everything is hard. He has to pick her up. It's just hard. So we stayed overnight with him. And after the Bible study was over, and I did all these fun things, answering questions, she labored and framed these words. She said, Share something for me. She said, pain, pain. She just kept, and I said, you know, as if I could share a verse to someone suffering. But what I did tell her, well, of course, I went to 2 Corinthians 4. It says that our present sufferings work in exceeding an eternal weight of glory. And she really loved that. And I told her, the more you suffer on earth, the greater capacity, it's almost like it enlarges our capacity, our output of glorifying God. So I said, some of us suffer very little on the Richter scale. You are like category five point something on the you know, F5 tornado. And I said, so you will begin eternity with a larger capacity to glorify God. If, look, look at this. But rejoice to the extent that you partake of Christ's suffering, that when his glory is revealed, you may be glad with exceeding joy. But look at how the 13 starts. Rejoice. Remember joy? The fruit of the Spirit, there are nine of them. Remember? Joy is the supernatural detachment from my circumstances. When my, my attitude is detached, it's not like this. You know, you, you get a raise, you feel better. You get a notice, you're off, you feel down. That's not a detachment from your circumstances. Your emotions are completely attached. Joy is a supernatural detachment. God produces in us this, this gratitude that, well, what I said, 
divine comfort. Christ has opened the door for us to have the God of all comfort comfort us. And he can come alongside us in anything. And at the end of the verse, when we see Peter referring to exceeding joy, we're reminded that biblical joy in the deepest sense is a profound confidence God is in control of every area of our lives, even the painful ones. And that's, that's something that, uh, that's why the early church, the soldiers, Trajan soldiers that were tasked with pushing the line of people off the cliffs in Bithynia. If you wouldn't deny Christ, if you wouldn't put incense for the emperor, they lined you up and pushed you off the cliff. The soldiers that were, the legionnaires that were pushing them, it got to be that legionnaires were saying, I can't push them. Then it went, by the time we get to Diocletian, legionnaires would get at the end of the line and say, might as well push me, I'm one of them too. Because of the, the divine, deep sense, confidence God is in control, even in painful places. The early believers experienced divine comfort. I think in America we know so much more than we experience because we have it all on the internet and we have all the galaxy of teachers and we have all the videos and, and MP3s. And, and so that's why, as my dear friend C.T. Studd once did, he had the missionary, he had a blue pencil and a red pencil and he marked in his Bible a red check for everything that God wanted him to experience and a blue check when he was experiencing it. And his daughters, they said they went through his Bible and they, they were amazed that he had a lifelong pursuit. He had a lot of them that weren't checked. It wasn't like he said, ah, I'm just everything. No. he Kind of the devotional method, asking God to do that in his life. 